Thank you. you. May be seated. Throughout the month of August, my exhortation has been to incite within you a stronger desire for prayer. It is certainly a great need within our country that we would be people of prayer. It's a great need within our own personal lives that we would be people of prayer. And starting this sermon series, we talked about the potential of prayer. I'm often asked, does prayer really change anything? To which we started with an affirmation that prayer changes everything. We also talked about uh, the power that drives prayer. That is our faith. Our faith is the fuel for our prayer. And not as sometimes it would be understood that we would uh, be trusting in what we think God is going to do. Now certainly it's great to have faith in what we know God has told us he will do. But when we are uncertain to what God will do, rather than saying, God, this is what I know you're going to do, we say, God, this is what I'd like you to do, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So instead of uh, faith in what we presume, we have faith in God's power. We also talked about not just uh, the power that drives prayer. We also talked about what we can do as persistence in prayer. We talked about how we get what God wants to give. And if we do not ask, we will not be given. So we persist in prayer because if we are asking for something outside of God's will, as we persist in that prayer, we will refine the requests that we have. Certainly, we persist in prayer because sometimes what God wants to give us is not the right time to give it to us. So in that, we persist in prayer because it helps us alleviate anxiety that we may have as we continue to remember God is in control and we can let it go. But lastly, and most importantly during this series, we've talked about the true purpose of prayer. Many times people think prayer is just a means of receiving a blessing from God. Prayer is giving God our shopping list, spiritually speaking. But the purpose of prayer is not just to receive a blessing, but to build a relationship. So much so that as we start this next message, which will be our final message on on prayer for this specific series, I want to give you an overarching statement to summarize what we've talked about and encourage what we will talk about. So if you have a bulletin in front of you, we're really going to be talking about making prayer a priority. But this is the main thing I want you to get, and I wrote this down across the top of my page. My spiritual life will never outgrow my prayer life. The purpose of prayer and building a relationship with God is so essential. You will never be higher in your spiritual walk than you are in your prayer walk. Prayer is a means for building a relationship, God. If, if you do not pray, that relationship will not be very strong. It's not the only way in which we build a relationship with God. Certainly, We hear from God in reading his word. We talk to God in prayer. We fellowship with other Christians. We come in corporate worship. Those are things we do. But prayer is one of those essential parts. One of the essential parts of building our relationship with God. If you do not pray, you will not be close to God. I've heard it said, a Christian cannot refuse to pray any more than a human can refuse to breathe. It is essential in our spiritual life. So what I want to encourage you to do is to put a priority on prayer. 
most Christians will be hindered in prayer from one of three things. Sin is obviously one of the big things that hinders our prayer. I've heard it said that if we persist in prayer, we will cease to sin. If we persist in sin, we will cease to pray. So sin can have a bearing and we need to get right before God before we can come to God. That's what makes a regular confession of sin important. But beyond that, another reason why people don't pray uh, might be a misunderstanding of what prayer is about. And uh, because of their misunderstanding, they get discouraged. But the, the number one reason that Christians don't pray because they say they don't have time to pray. Many people would say, well, pastor, I would pray more if I had more time. And that may be true at some level, but in all honesty, those things that you put first, you will always have time for. I mean, there's a difference between being interested in something and if we are interested in something, the time that we find, we will do what interests us. Being committed to something means that we will make time for that that we are committed to. It's a little bit like eating. We talked about breathing, even eating. What's the longest you've been without eating? can't be more than 30 days pretty much but the idea being this if you need it you will do it so if you take prayer and make it a greater priority putting it as something that you need you will make time for that that's one of the reasons that fasting is pretty cool when we stop eating when we're reminded of our need to eat by the hunger that we have we, we focus on prayer instead for that short time that we may choose not to eat. But in all honesty, every one of us has 24 hours in a day. And despite what needs we may have, we can make time to pray. Take a look at this first video. I woke up this morning with a normal feeling for me. It felt like sadness, but more like hunger than anything else. The closest word for it is empty. Whatever the feeling was, I wanted it to go away. Within an hour of waking up, this feeling's usually gone. Coffee can do it catching up on sports, and by the time I check my email, I'm good. At least I'm full for the present. The feeling, whatever it was, is gone. But quite easily, I slip back into the emptiness, if not the next hour, the next day. Technology gives me the quickest, most instantly gratifying fill. That's why I like social media. All I really need is one like on Instagram, and I'm golden. Facebook can do it too, as long as it's about me. And I look on Twitter to get my sarcasm fill for the day. It doesn't really take much, but it doesn't really last long either. If social media doesn't do it, music always fills me up, especially when I'm driving. I got my tunes, the open road, and I can listen to whatever I want. I rock the same songs over and over again. I was empty. Now I'm filled. I have millions of ways to fill up. I didn't even mention TV, movies, or beach vacations, alcohol, cars, home improvements, accolades at work. 
Whatever I want, I can have it. With the touch of a button or the drop of a hat, the world is at my fingertips. I can fill myself with whatever I want, cash pending. All I have to do is convince myself that it's good to eat and desirable for food. Then it's just a matter of plucking my choice fruit from the tree. No wonder I don't need God to be filled. I'm already full. It will be my goal to convince you to put a higher priority on prayer. Not that the other things in your life are necessarily wrong. But when we elevate prayer, then we can make time to do what we need to do. We're going to be looking at a person who was demonstrating a priority on prayer. If you have a copy of God's Word nearby, I encourage you, if you have not already, make your way to the book of Daniel, Old Testament. Uh, you can open the Old Testament, generally find yourself in the middle with the book of Psalms. So Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. So not too far from the book of Psalms, you'll find uh, a relatively decent-sized book, the book of Daniel. And in this book, we have narrative and prophecy but we will be in a narrative portion by which Daniel is reflecting on some of the things that have happened in his life. And what we will see from a fairly familiar story is that Daniel put a high priority on prayer. So if you found the place and as you are able, would you stand with me as a sign of respect for God's holy, written, inerrant word. Daniel chapter 6 Starting in verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground or complaint against this Daniel, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Lord, I ask that you'd help us elevate prayer to where it should be as an essential priority of our lives. Through this, Father, that we would make choices that would ultimately change our lives because we ask it in Christ's name. And God's people said, thank you. you. may be seated. We see Daniel was a good guy. Daniel was elevated in Babylon because he was a good guy. At this time, you realize the nation uh, has been taken to Babylon. And as uh, Israel, as a nation, was taken to Babylon, some of the most distinguished people were brought into the king's audience. And those distinguished people, some of which were elevated. And we see by Daniel chapter 6 that Daniel was one of those people. So there were some people that were jealous of Daniel. Do you have anybody like that in your life? Somebody that may intentionally set stumbling blocks before you to try to make you fall? Well, what Daniel saw was this very thing. If you look back in the, the passage, it says that the high officials came to King Darius and they convinced him. They said, hey, 
Darius, you know what you need to do? You need to make a decree that no one would ask anything for anything or for anything in, unless they ask you. No one asks anyone for anything unless they ask you for 30 days. Darius says, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Uh, verse 8, it says, now, O king, establish this injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document injunction. So there had been now a law passed. No one could ask anyone for anything except the king. This, by definition, would prohibit prayer. What did Daniel do? Now keep in mind, this wasn't just punishable by a class C misdemeanor and a fine. This was punishable by death. If you were caught praying, you would most definitely be killed. Not just killed in a normal way. You'd be fed to hungry lions. So look what Daniel did in the middle of this specific event. It said verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Did Daniel place a high priority on prayer? Did he demonstrate that prayer was essential in his life? Even though he may face certain death, as he will, he still prayed. Uh, first thing I wrote down was this, and I think this is, is a pretty obvious implication. A priority on prayer requires intentional effort. You will not pray unless you make an effort to pray. In other words, as much as prayer is essential for our spiritual life, it is not natural for human beings to pray. Sure, we may pray when we feel like there's nothing else we can do, but making prior, prayer a priority is not looking to prayer as a last resort, but it's a first response. So when we make this effort to pray, we are elevating prayer to a greater priority. Daniel demonstrated that. He was willing to face death. What do we allow as a greater priority than our prayer? The opening video, you talked about some things that were not necessarily bad, but can give us a temporary fix for this desire we have for the immortal, invisible God that wants to have a relationship for us. Many times we say we don't have time to pray, but we spend a lot of time doing things that maybe we just don't need to do. I mean, if we took our lives and made a nice little pie chart and said, okay, here's what I spend my time doing. You know, the majority of your time would be done for something that would be essential, uh, no doubt. And there's other things that would come in. But how much of your time, can you honestly say, is given to things that you have an option to do? It may differ depending on the person. But all of us could make small changes to put prayer as a higher priority. Jesus gave us a great example of this. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, that is Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate prayer place, and there he prayed. If anyone would demonstrate a, a lack of need of prayer, the perfect Son of God might you would think, not need to pray. If anyone had a lot of things that were, he was needing to do, I mean, people by the thousands were looking for him at this point. 
And not only some of them to do him harm, some of them to, to bring their sick, and some of them to look for food. Jesus was busy. But he demonstrated a priority on prayer. He got himself up just a little bit early, and he spent time doing the thing he needed to do, which was prayer. So you could, just by definition, go to sleep a little bit earlier and get up a little bit earlier, and the first thing you choose to do to make sure you do it is prayer. So instead of just waiting for time to appear, you are making time for prayer. Now, one of the things I hear people say sometimes is, I want to pray. And I hope you can say you want to pray. But there are many things in my life that compete with my focus on prayer. That could be one of two things. It could be like Daniel, something really specific, something really big could have taken his attention. Like the whole thing about not praying could have distracted him. But even if it's not something big, we can be distracted from prayer even in the little things. I wrote this down under point number one. I will need to learn to overcome distractions. To be proficient in prayer, we need to learn to overcome the distractions. Certainly the big things that might take our time, but even the small things when we're sitting and talking to God, how often is it that our mind wanders? It might be a little bit like this. Take a look at this. Hey, I like dog. Will you have your dog? Whoa. Wonder who he belongs to. Sit, boy. Hey, look, he's trained. She. Uh huh. Speak. Hi there. <gasps> Did that dog just say hi there? Oh yes. Right. My name is Doug. I have just met you, and I love you. <laughs> My master made me this collar. He is a good and smart master, and he made me this collar so that I may talk. Squirrel! My master is good and smart. It's not possible. Oh, it is, because my master is smart. <gasps> cool. What do these do, boy? Hey, would you call that cradle contigo? I use that collar. Watashiwa Hanashima. To talk with him. I would be happy if you stop. Russell, don't touch that. It could be radioactive or something. I am a great tracker. My pack sent me on a special mission all by myself. Have you seen a bird? I want to find one, and I've been on the scent. I'm a great tracker. Did I mention that? Hey, that is a bird. I have never seen one up close, but this is a bird. May I take your bird back to camp as my prisoner? Yes, yes, take it. And on the way, learn how to bark like a real dog. I can bark. <coughs> and here's howling. <coughs> Can we keep him, please, please, please? No. But it's a talking dog. It's just a weird trick or something. Let's get to the fall. I don't know if you feel that way where in the middle of talking to God and all of a sudden, hey, squirrel. And it may be just momentary distractions and those things happen and as much as we, in a conversation with another person, would get back on track, we would. But even more so, there may be big things that happen. You get up and you're planning to spend time in prayer, and all of a sudden, you hear a, a child cry. Of course, you need to deal with that. You hear a knock on the door. The phone rings. You get a text message. Any number of things can come into our life to distract us. We have to learn to overcome distractions. That's what Daniel did. Even though he had a huge issue come into his life that would impede most people from prayer, Daniel chose to persist in prayer. He even demonstrated this intentional effort. It says he prayed three times a day. Not just after it was illegal to pray, but all the time, he was intentional in his effort to pray. 
The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6 a means of doing just that. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and, and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Everybody say, shut the door. Now you probably say that a lot if you have children. But here, we're not just talking about a motivation to pray. Instead of praying to be seen by others, we should pray to, to be seen by God. But he's also giving us a, a comfortable methodology for praying. He's saying, if you're going to pray, go in and what? Shut the door. In other words, the things that might come in to distract us, we put a barrier between us and them. We, we take time and we say, yes, there is other things that need my attention. Yes, there's other things that want my time. But guess what? We're going to do what? We're going to shut the door on those things. We're going to say, okay, this time is time between me and God. And you may not at first have a lot of success at keeping the door shut. But the great thing about this promise is, when we do good things like prayer, God will bless us. I wrote this down under point number one, letter B. Any good effort will be rewarded by God. The Bible says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Any good effort. If you take and spend a little bit more time in prayer, God will bless that. Now, hear me on this. Many people think of the blessings from God as only being temporal. If I pray more, I will get richer. Health, wealth, prosperity will all be mine if I just pray enough. In this passage, did Daniel, who put a high priority on prayer receive health, wealth, prosperity? Was it a temporal reward that he had? Look again in the text. Then it says, verse 12, Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days accept to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king said, Yes, this thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians. Then they said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction that you've signed, but makes petition three times a day. Then the king when he heard these words, was, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said, No, O king, that is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of of lions. Think about this. If prayer always brought a temporal reward, when Daniel chose to keep a priority on prayer, even though it was illegal, the expectation would be he'd be fine. But in this very situation, Daniel experienced that which he might have found somewhat discouraging. I mean, if we persist in prayer, if we put a priority on prayer, we might think that things are going to go well. And if things don't go well, 
we might stop praying as much. If we thought the only blessing that came from prayer was a temporal reward. But the true purpose of prayer is not just to get things from God, but is to draw closer to God. So I wrote this down, point number two. A priority on prayer requires intense faith. Let me ask you this. Do you think Daniel prayed when he entered the den of lions? Atheists pray when they are facing death. I mean, I've heard it said there are no atheists ever in a foxhole. If, if you've got bullets flying over your head, you're going to reach out to God, folks. So yes, Daniel at that time did pray, more than likely. We don't know specifically, the passage doesn't say, but I'm guessing yes. So even though Daniel was praying in an emergency situation, did not diminish the fact that Daniel stood fast in his faith. In other words, I would think if I were in that situation and I had stayed true to what God had asked me to do, if I put a priority on prayer, even though I might face a den of lions, I might be a little discouraged if I got thrown into the den of lions because I did what God asked me to do. If I was focusing only on temporal rewards. Now the question is, was Daniel a man that only focused on what was in front of him, like the presence of lions or the absence of lions? Or was Daniel a man that understood that the closeness of his relationship with God was of greater priority even than temporal blessings? Take a look again in the text. It gives us an insight to this in verse uh, 22. Uh, remember, and I know you already know this story, uh, he was not attacked by the lions. He probably just laid up the next one of them while they were purring, perhaps. Uh, uh, lions do purr. Um, but we don't know. We just know that God delivered him not from the lion's den, but he delivered them in the lion's den. And then it says in verse 22, My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found in him, because he had trusted in his God. You see the presence of faith being given? Even though he was in the midst of a very difficult situation, by nothing other than his willingness to obey God, he still said, God is in control, I can let it go. The very pure character of God and the very sovereign hand of God has not diminished because of what I'm facing. I wrote this down under point number two. I will need to learn to avoid discouragement. A priority on prayer requires intense faith. If Satan cannot distract you, he will try to discourage you. We see Satan attacking Job, a guy that was doing things right by God and for purpose that we cannot necessarily easily grasp, God allowed Satan to try to discourage Job. And many times Christians will say, why did this happen to me? They will have difficulty that will come into their life and they're doing right. And they'll say, God, why? And the simple fact is this. God allows pain for a good purpose. Think of it this way. 
if you are asking God why that he's allowed pain into your life without acknowledging that there may be a good purpose for it, think of where Jesus was. Jesus, who lived a perfect life, found great pain. Not only did God allow that pain, but God willingly said, this pain is going to be yours. But what good came of Jesus Christ being nailed to the cross? The pain he experienced by his very stripes on his back, we are healed. That we know we can have a relationship with God. Great good for the whole world by the pain that Jesus faced. Can you trust God that the pain you're facing has a good purpose? Can you still put a priority on prayer even though bad things may happen? The temptation is to be discouraged. And if you're discouraged, you're probably in good company. Job got discouraged. Elijah got discouraged. He said, Elijah said in 1 Kings 19, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Moses got discouraged. Numbers 11, he said, How am I supposed to get all the meat for these people? You've given them manna, but they want meat. And he says, For they weep before me. Give us meat to eat. If you treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see the wretchedness. Paul, 2 Corinthians 1, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. If you're discouraged, that's okay. Let's just get past it. We get past it by trusting God. Saying, although I have pain, there's got to be a good purpose for it. Because God is still good, and God is still in control. So when we trust him, then we can get past any discouragement that we may face. Jesus said it this way in John 16. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. God is in control. You can let it go. When we come to God, we say, God, I trust you, even in the difficult time. That's what Daniel did. Even though he was in the very den of lions, that which he thought he might avoid because of his willingness to pray, I, I, I can imagine he might have been confronted at least with the temptation for discourage. He might have been momentarily discouraged, but the Bible says he persisted in faith. He trusted his God. We sometimes have difficulty imagining that God will let us suffer but suffering can be good i remember a report was talking about a drought that had taken over a specific town in the u.s and many of the farmers were having a lot of problem because of the drought uh, even orchards of trees were dying because of lack of rain one particular orchard was still doing okay and so this news reporter came to this orchard and was talking to the farmer and said why is it when everyone else has things dying your trees are still alive he said well when they were young I kept water from them I intentionally didn't give them all they needed so that they learned to put roots down deep these trees they can go another few weeks without water because they had it within them to dig down deep. Take a look at this. We all face moments 
our faith is tested. But in these moments of doubt, we find our strength in Christ. Rooted and built up in Him, we stand strong, unwavering, like a tree firmly planted, we hold fast, trusting his promises. For God is our refuge and our fortress, rooted in his unfailing love. We cannot be shaken. Another example would be Joseph of the Old Testament. Remember, Joseph was a favorite son who was thrown into slavery. While he was a slave, he ascended to a, a manager of a whole household, to which, because he did the right thing, was thrown into prison. While he ascended even to the high ranks of within prison, it was then as a prisoner that God chose to take him and make him the number three guy in all of Egypt. And there, in great power in Egypt, even over his brothers that sold him into slavery, God used Joseph to deliver much of the nation that was having difficulty. And if we can trust God, even through the surprises, we'll be stronger for it. I wrote this down for letter B under point number two. The surprises in life shouldn't shape my confidence in God. The surprises can shake my confidence in God, but the, the surprises shouldn't be allowed to shake my confidence in God. God sometimes will choose to save us from the fire. Sometimes he'll choose us to save us in the fire. You look at Daniel 6, and if you look back at the first five chapters of Daniel preceding that, you see Daniel was a man that was experienced by God's deliverance. Yes, he was taken captive. But while he was taken captive, God used him to interpret dreams and he rose in authority and privilege. He, he chose to follow the dietary laws that God had given him rather than eat the delicacies from the king. And he still continued to do well. And even here in chapter 6 where he chose to put a priority on prayer even though he faced the death penalty, God continued to protect him. The temptation may be to get discouraged. But I pray that you will stand firm. Remember a story. Another farmer in this story had an old well. And he had an old dog. His old dog, for some reason, was around the well and fell into the old well. Now this farmer loved his dog, had the dog for many years. But as he looked down at his dog at the bottom of this well, he started counting the cost. He imagined how hard it would be to pull this dog out of the well. He, he couldn't imagine how much it would take to, to bring this dog whom he loved the well was dry, so he decided that he would just bury his dog and at the same time cover up the well. So he chose to get his shovel and, and begin filling the well. Now you can imagine for the dog, hearing the master's presence above him, holding on to hope, that this would be deliverance was probably pretty discouraged when he felt the shovelfuls of dirt hit his back. Whimpering, the dog saw that he had an opportunity. Rather to get discouraged, he, he shook the dirt off and stepped up on it. 
Yes, the, the, the dirt came down again and it hurt. There were times that there was rock in the soil and it bruised his back. But he chose rather than to give up, to shake it off and to step on up. The dirt continued to fall. The discouragement continued to tempt him. But the dog chose to stand firm, to shake it off and take a step up. And it wasn't long before he found himself just an arm's length from his own master and he jumped out of the well that he was in. How much more when we have a pure and holy master, although the dirt of this life may come upon us and we may be surprised by the suffering that we face, we know that our master means it for good. We can shake it off and we can take a step on up. If we put a high priority on prayer, we will develop a close relationship with God. I will tell you that you will never progress in your spiritual life farther than you progress in your prayer life. We need to make prayer something essential. And sure, we will have distractions. And that's why we need to shut the door. Get alone with God. Try to eliminate as much distractions as we can. Sure, we may find discouragement. That's one of the great reasons why we come together to pray. How encouraging it is to gather with another brother or sister in Christ. That's why we have these intentional prayer meetings on Wednesday night. So we can gather together and pray with someone. Someone that will pray with us. Someone that will pray for us. And we can find encouragement through the fellowship of Jesus Christ our Lord. The priority should be prayer. Even though things may not be going the way we like even though we're tempted to be discouraged. Last thing I wrote down was simply this. God will do an amazing work when his people pray. That's promised. I mean, you can look in the book of Daniel if you still have your Bible open. It said that the king was exceedingly glad commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no harm would come to him because he had trusted in God. Verse 24, And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives, and before they had reached the bottom of the den, lions overpowered them. Verse 25, Then King Darius wrote to all the people's the nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. The priority on prayer in Daniel's life, although he was tempted to be distracted, although he was tempted to be discouraged, God did an amazing work because one of his people chose to pray. And how much more if we gather together as a congregation, if we gather together to pray that God will do an amazing thing. Yes, it may be that you're being bruised. Certainly, you may have enemies that are casting things in front of you. Trust God to deal with them. Trust God to deliver you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be reminded of the important priority of prayer. Lord, I confess, I don't pray as often as I should. I don't know if anyone could say that they do. 
But Father, I pray right now that you would inspire in each one of us a desire to put a priority on prayer. That, Father, we might be like Jesus to get up early in the morning and to shut the door and to find time for prayer, to make time for prayer. And that we would be like Daniel in the sense that we would overcome any potential discouragement. We would re re release ourselves from the temptation towards distraction. And through this, Father, that you would do an amazing work when your people choose to pray. This, Father, we ask in Christ's name. And God's people said,